In our study yesterday, we were looking at some of the remarkable spiritual blessings that the Apostle Paul sets out for us in Ephesians chapter 1. Blessings that we can enjoy in the heavenlies in Christ. So we, we looked at verse 4, which said that God hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Then we moved on to the next verse, and we saw that there is the blessing of being children of God by adoption. And then there's that remarkable blessing of redemption. First, the forgiveness of our sins, as it says here in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1. And then ultimately, it will lead to a complete release from sin and death. Redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that then takes us to Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9. The next spiritual blessing that we, did, we didn't get to yesterday is insight into God's purpose. So in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle writes, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. He hath made known unto us, says the apostle, the mystery of his will. Now, the word mystery means something secret. It's, it's not the idea of being uh, impossible to understand, which is the way we tend to use the word mystery today, isn't it? Something that's uh, difficult or impossible to understand. That, that's how we tend to use the word. I remember quite a number of years ago now having a discussion with a colleague on the doctrine of the Trinity. And this colleague was believing the doctrine of the Trinity and trying to persuade me to believe it as well. I hasten to add that's before I went to work at the Christadelphian office. <laughs> but in the end, this colleague had to admit that she couldn't explain the doctrine of the Trinity, so she just shrugged her shoulders and said, it's a mystery. Well, of course, she was right. It is something which cannot be properly understood or explained. But that is not the meaning of the term here, where the Apostle Paul speaks about the mystery of his will. In Scripture, the idea is used of secrets which belong to God and are revealed by him to men and women. And the same Greek word that is translated mystery here in verse 9 also interestingly occurs in the Greek uh, of Daniel chapter 2 and verse 19 in connection with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the Septuagint, then was the secret, that is the mystery, the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. So it's something then that God chooses to reveal when he wishes to. And the same term also occurs in a couple of other passages in the New Testament that I think are particularly enlightening. That passage in Romans chapter 16, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So that's the mystery, something which was secret, but now God has chosen to reveal. And again, um, Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 to 27, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So when we come back then here to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9, the mystery of which Paul speaks to the Ephesians is not something which has to be kept secret, Rather, it is a secret that God wills to be made known. So what a blessing that is, brothers and sisters. Privilege of having this insight into God's purpose. But then, when we come on to verse 10, there's another privilege, isn't there, of becoming God's people. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, 
both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So we, we follow the sequence of thought here, and we find the secret of God's will has been made known. It includes adoption, acceptance, forgiveness of sins. Through this, the body of Christ is formed, constituting those who are going to rule with Christ in the age to come. And then that's what he means when he talks about it. He, he speaks about, in verse 10, the dispensation of the fullness of time. He's taking us forward there into the millennium. That he might gather together in one all things in Christ. That expression, gather together in one, is actually a translation of one Greek word. Gather together in one. The revised version renders it as to sum up. The Greek word there is used for putting the sum total above a column of figures. Here the idea seems to be to bring to a head. He brings to a head all things in Christ, whether rulers, that is things in the heaven, or as the revised version has it, things in the heavens, and the things upon the earth. So that is God's purpose, to bring together in Christ all things in one, to bring to a head in him, whether rulers, the things in the heavens, or the people, the things on the earth. The original purpose of creation is going to be accomplished when, as he says here in verse 10, all things are subdued under Christ. All things are subdued under Christ. Now that phrase, all things, as we may well be aware, is a a phrase, really, which takes us through the whole of Scripture. It's drawn here from Psalm 8. And the words of Psalm 8 are, in turn, drawn from Genesis 1, verse 26. Man was created in the image and the likeness of the Elohim, and he was to have dominion. In fact, that's stated twice, isn't it, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. Man was to have dominion over every living thing. He, together with his wife, was to be the dominant creature over God's creation. But as a result of man's sin, that dominion was lost, and he was driven out of Eden. The psalmist in Psalm 8 picks up those words of Genesis when he says, Thou madest him have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. And he's not just speaking historically there, but prophetically of the future fulfilment of that original commission to man. <clears throat> the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2 applies those very words to Christ, as does the Apostle Paul here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. Eventually all things are going to be subject to him. He will have the dominion, and through him others also will be able to share in it. And the all things even include death itself. Just keep your finger here and come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So the all things then that we read about includes death itself. Only God himself is accepted. And all things will only finally be put under Christ when death itself is removed. Here, then, the original purpose of creation is accomplished.
And we come down then to the final one of those spiritual blessings that we identified in Ephesians chapter 1, the promised inheritance. That promised inheritance, having been enjoyed throughout the millennial age, will eventually be experienced in all its fullness when, as Paul writes, God will be all in all. So what a wonderful series of blessings we have set out for us in this opening chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Now I just want us to move across to the beginning of chapter 2. Again at the end of chapter 1 we have all things put under Christ's feet. He's given to be head over all things to the ecclesia which is his body. And then when we come to the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2 we have this. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And we note that the second chapter of Ephesians begins with the word and. Of course, the chapter divisions were not part of the original text. They've been put in later. And so sometimes they obscure links that we need to note. And this chapter begins with the word and. So it tells us then that the sequence of thought is continuing from the previous chapter. Chapter 1 concludes by declaring that God had raised Christ from the dead and exalted him. He had been quickened or made alive. And ultimately the hope of his followers is to be made alive in the same sense. However, there is also a parallel with Christ's experience in a spiritual sense in the believer's life now. And Paul reminds the Ephesians that they had been dead in trespasses and sins. That was their former position, and indeed ours. But now they've been made alive, he says, in Christ. They were walking, in the language of Romans 6, in newness of life, as we are through baptism into the Lord's name, which provides remission, pardoning, forgiveness of sins, which we have only in him. You hath he quickened. Now, do you notice in verse 1, the words hath he quickened are in italics. So they're not actually there in the original. They've been inserted there by the translators to make the verse more readable. The verb is not actually in the text, in the Greek text at all at this point, but it does come in verse 5. So it is actually there, so in fact the translators are quite correct in the way they've rendered it. In verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. So made alive then in Christ. But then in verse 2 he says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, in the children of disobedience. So what is this prince of the power of the air? Well, Paul here is looking at the former course, the former manner of life of the Ephesians. And the idea of air is sometimes used in a figurative sense in Scripture. And when we look carefully at this verse 2, we can see that the Apostle Paul is actually using three different phrases that essentially make the same point. It's repetition for emphasis, which we often get in Scripture. Describing the former way of life of the Ephesians, he says, they walked according to this world, the course of this world. Or to put it another way, they walked according to the prince of the power of the air. That is to say, according to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, the course of this world is evil and temporary, and it's something, as Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1, from which we need to be delivered. The course of this world. Remember, in Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul writes, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. J.B. Phillips actually has a brilliant paraphrase of those words of Romans 12. He's, he's not always right in his, uh, his renderings, but this time he's really hit the nail on the head. Be not conformed to this world, 
Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mould. The world will make us conform to its standards if it can. And Paul is saying we have to resist that. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now in the context then, when we come back to this verse in Ephesians 2, the prince of the power of the air then has to be sin, if you like, with a capital S. The political power of the world, which is filled with the spirit of disobedience. It's dominated, isn't it, by the thinking of the flesh. Do you remember the Lord Jesus in John chapter 12 said, the prince of this world will be cast out. Sin, the political power of the world, which is dominated by this spirit of disobedience. And it seems very likely that Paul is using the word air in a similar way in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. Remember when he speaks about the saints being caught away amid clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And it may just be a reference to the mode of transport, but when you think about the way in which air is used here, surely there at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is pointing out that at the return of the Lord, the air, in a figurative sense, is going to be changed in the kingdom. The political power of the world is going to change hands. And if we view Paul's reference to the air in 1 Thessalonians 4 in that way, he's indicating then that the saints are going to be caught away at the return of the Lord into a position of authority. The air will be changed in the kingdom. So, verse 3. Among whom also we had our conversation, our manner of life in times past, in the lusts, the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. By nature, he says, we were children of wrath. Now, when you look at the context here, at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2, he's saying that it was their unacceptable behaviour that made them subject to divine judgment objects of God's wrath. He's not saying, in verse 3, that because of their nature, they were children of wrath. He's not saying the very fact that they were born mortal, with a nature that has a sin tendency, made them children of wrath. I mean, think of Christ. He shared our nature. Was he, therefore, a child of wrath? Well, as Brother John Carter pointed out many years ago, to ask such a question is to answer it. Is man estranged, asked Brother Carter, because of his physical nature? The answer of Scripture is that we are alienated by ignorance and wicked works. Alienated by ignorance, Ephesians 4 verse 18, and wicked works, Colossians chapter 1 verse 21. That's what alienates us from God. Now, this has uh, sometimes over the years been a point of debate in our community. It's created some difficulties. And so it is important that, uh, that we understand this correctly. And in fact, um, that passage from Brother Carter is found in the Australian Unity document, which is a very helpful book. The issue actually arose way back in the 1890s, when Brother Roberts was dealing with the issues created by J.J. Andrew. And he put a passage in the Christadelphian magazine in 1894 that dealt with this very matter. The article was written by Brother Janaway, and this is what it said. By nature, children of wrath. True. But what does Paul mean? Does he mean that God is angry with us as soon as we are born? The very text in which the phrase occurs excludes such an unreasonable doctrine. He speaks of lusts of the flesh, desires of the flesh, desires of the mind, conversation in times past, wherein we walked, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, all of which have to do with nature, but which require action superadded. Of all sin, it may truly be said, it is our nature so to do. We are truly by nature children of wrath, but is wrath against evil doing. 
any other wrath is inconceivable. And that, I think, is a very helpful passage in just clarifying exactly what the Apostle Paul means here when he uses this particular expression. But when we hear and respond to the word of God, a change takes place. Just come back for a moment, if you will, to John's Gospel, chapter 5. John, chapter 5. Verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The hour is coming, and now is, says the Lord, when the dead would hear the voice of the Son of God. So he's speaking there about those who were figuratively dead and who would be able to hear his voice. He deals with those who are literally dead from verse 28 onwards, when he talks about those who are in the graves. So here then in verses 24 and 25, spiritual death gives way to quickening, being made alive in Christ. And that contrast again came out in our introductory reading, didn't it? If you come back to Ephesians chapter 2, in verses 11 to 13. The same contrast. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That is to say, through his sacrificial work. And it takes us back in thought, doesn't it, to chapter 1, verse 7. That redemption that we have through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. There's another parallel passage that helps with this in Colossians. We've been thinking about Colossians in our evening sessions, but just um, come across to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. Where it's exactly the same point that's being made, just in slightly different words. Colossians 2 verse 13. And you being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now the physical uncircumcision in this passage denotes their former course of Gentile life without the guidance of God's word. The quickening here is explained as the forgiveness of sins. Made alive in Christ. What a blessing the forgiveness of sins really is. What a privilege we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come back to Ephesians chapter 2. The apostle develops his argument by explaining God's purpose, which unites both Jew and Gentile in the house of God. So chapter 2 then of Ephesians, verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. God has broken down, says Paul, the middle wall of partition. Well, what exactly does that mean? It takes us back in thought to some words of the prophet Isaiah. We go back to Isaiah chapter 5, or at least we think back to Isaiah chapter 5, we have that parable of the vineyard. You remember in those early verses of Isaiah chapter 5, God is the owner of the vineyard. He fenced it about, or he put a wall around it. He gathered out the stones, says Isaiah, 
And we're told there in verse 7 of Isaiah 5 that the vineyard represents the house of Israel. The stones represent the Gentiles taken out of the land so that the children of Israel could dwell there. And of course, in a, a spiritual sense, if you like, that was very true, wasn't it? That parable was very true of Israel. The nation of Israel was fenced off by God, actually in more than one sense. Geographically, Israel was isolated. It had a wall about it. To the north lay the high mountains of Lebanon. On the east, there was the deep Jordan Valley with desert beyond. To the south, there was desert and mountains. And of course, to the west, there was the Mediterranean Sea. So geographically then, God had, in a sense, fenced off his vineyard, his land. But Israel was also fenced off, in another sense, by the law that God gave to the nation. It separated Israel from the idolatrous Gentile nations around them. Remember the words of Balaam's prophecy in Numbers 23. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. And many years later then, here in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is referring in verse 14 to the law as a wall. And here he's explaining that not only faithful Jews, but also Gentiles are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And in establishing this unity between Jew and Gentile, Christ, we're told, has broken down the middle wall of partition. Now here the Apostle Paul was comparing the law to a division in the temple. Gentiles could only proceed as far as the court of the Gentiles and there was a balustrade which I think was about 1.5 meters high, a balustrade preventing them from proceeding any further. There were notices in Greek and Latin that gave a warning that the penalty for a Gentile going beyond the dividing wall was death. And Josephus also refers to this particular prohibition. And apparently the Romans permitted the Jewish authorities to pass the death sentence for this particular offence, even if the offender were a Roman citizen. It was something that was taken so very seriously. You may recall that Paul was mistakenly thought to have committed an offence of this kind, of aiding and abetting an Ephesian to go beyond the dividing wall during his last visit to Jerusalem in Acts 21. And in that chapter, the, his Jewish opponents cried out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. So that was the accusation that he'd actually taken someone, a Gentile, beyond the dividing wall. Well, there's a, a copy of uh, one of the inscriptions that's been found. Uh, this particular uh, inscription was found in Jerusalem in 1871 by Clermont Gano. Uh, it's currently housed, I believe, in the Istanbul Museum. It was written in Greek, seven lines of Greek capitals, so that Gentiles would be able to understand what was written. And it warned, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. And there was a second uh, fragmentary example of that found later in 1935. So we know that those signs, those lines of text were put up around the area to warn Gentiles of the penalty for going beyond the dividing wall. And in Acts chapter 21, Paul was attacked and he was nearly beaten to death, wasn't he, by an angry crowd. Interestingly enough, if you just keep your finger here and come back to um, Acts 21, we know that he was rescued by Roman soldiers who came running down into the temple precincts And just as a little aside, Acts chapter 21 and verse 32, it says that the soldiers and centurions ran down unto them, 
And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. They ran down. Then come to verse 35. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people, and then he, he wants to talk to them. So there are stairs there. The soldiers run down. Paul then stands on the stairs. And there's another reference to it in verse 40. Paul stood on the stairs, beckoned with his hands to the people. Now, those references to stairs, just put in the text, if you like, in passing, are another example of the minute accuracy of the historical record here, because these references confirm our historical knowledge. Roman soldiers could very quickly deal with any trouble of this kind in the temple precincts, because they were stationed right next door, as you can see on the picture there, in the adjoining Antonia Fortress, northwest of the temple area which communicated with the outer court by two flights of steps. And that's what Luke is referring to here, when the soldiers came running down those stairs and they rescued the Apostle Paul before the crowd could beat him to death. And in Paul's address that follows, when we get into chapter 22, he refers to his earlier life as a Pharisee, he mentions his persecution of the early brethren with the full approval of the Jewish rulers, his experience on the Damascus Road, and his conversion. And they listened to him until, verse 21, he spoke about being sent far hence to the Gentiles. And they wouldn't listen any further. When he got to that point, they'd heard enough. He said he was sent far hence to the Gentiles. Now, at the time when Paul delivered that speech here in Acts 22, the middle wall, as it is in Ephesians 2, was still standing. But by this point, it was obsolete. The sacrifice of Christ having provided the one way in which both Jew and Gentile could come to God. Well, let's come back to Ephesians then, shall we? Just come now to Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul commences a prayer. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So he commences his prayer there at the beginning of chapter 3. He calls himself a prisoner, and he was, both in a literal and spiritual sense, he had been apprehended by Christ and sent as his ambassador to them. This commission led to his arrest and eventually his imprisonment in Rome. But I think when we're looking at this particular chapter, and we're going, we haven't quite finished with chapter 2, but when we look at chapter 3 of Ephesians, we have to bear in mind that a large part of it is in parenthesis. And it might help if uh, in your Bible you just put a bracket from the beginning of verse 2 all the way through to the end of verse 13, because the whole of that section is in parenthesis. He begins his prayer in verse 1, for this cause I, Paul. Then he breaks off, you often find this in Paul's writings, he interrupts his main theme to introduce additional matters. This reference in verse 1 to his work for the Gentiles leads him to explain the commission he was given to develop God's plan by extending the offer of salvation to them. He calls himself the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. So that's the explanation that you get in verses 2 to 13. And then you notice in verse 14 he starts all over again where he left off in verse 1. For this cause. And then we have the prayer. So he begins the prayer in verse 1, he breaks off to explain the work he had to do with the Gentiles, and then he comes back to the prayer in verse 14, and we have that then in the latter part of chapter 3. It's resumed in verse 14, for this cause. So as the Gentiles have been called to be part of God's household, as Paul has shown in chapter 2, Paul now offers a prayer on their behalf. So that's just summarised then on the screen. Chapter 3, verse 14. 
For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now do you notice that God here is referred to as the Father? And the fatherhood of God is actually a noticeable theme here in Ephesians. He is first the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, as chapter 1 has told us. Just just have a look back to chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right at the start of the epistle, that's the declaration that's made. He is first the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. So there it is again. It's the fatherhood of God. He's first the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you see, when you get into chapter 2 of Ephesians, he is also the Father of those made nigh by the blood of Christ, his adopted children. Just look at chapter 2, verse 18. Through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So he is first the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then here in chapter 2, he is also the Father of those made nigh by the blood of Christ, his adopted children. And so it's very appropriate then, when we get to chapter 3, that the prayer is addressed to the Father. And although we're not going to follow this up in detail, just for the sake of completeness, notice the reference is also in chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter 6 and verse 23... Peace be unto the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the way in which this theme goes all the way through. Now I want to come back to the prayer in chapter 3. So we're in chapter 3 and we're in verses 14 and 15. In this prayer of chapter 3, as we say, God is described as the Father. Now, the manuscript evidence suggests that the words of our Lord Jesus Christ are not actually there in the original Greek of verse 14. But as we've already shown, the idea is quite clearly in Paul's mind because he's already referred to Christ, uh, to God as the Father of Lord Jesus Christ back in chapter 1. So it's not really out of place here at all in verse 14. But here in verses 14 and 15, it is the Father of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In actual fact, there's a play on words in the Greek here. The word translated family is derived from the word for father. So in other words, the family of saints receives its name from the father. I've just set that out on the screen if you you want the point. It's a play on words in the Greek. The family of saints receives its name from the Father. And we say the family of saints here because there is no suggestion at all in Paul's words of the idea held by some in the churches around us of the universal fatherhood of God over all mankind. In fact, that's why the words of the hymn were changed, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, dear Lord and maker of mankind, is much more appropriate. See, when you look at Paul's prayer here, there is no suggestion at all of that idea which some hold in the churches around of this universal fatherhood of God. It's talking about the family of saints receiving its name from the Father. And this point um, is reinforced when we pick up, in verses 14 and 15, echoes of the Davidic covenant. God's promises to David. And there I've just set it out for you. In 2 Samuel 7, David was promised a seed of whom God said, I will be his father. And Paul echoes that when he writes to the Ephesians and he speaks about God as the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Davidic covenant also said 
He shall build a house for my name. And of course there's a dual idea there, isn't there? On the one hand there's the spiritual house of which the Lord Jesus Christ is the head, but there's also the literal aspect to be fulfilled when the temple foretold by Ezekiel will be built in the age to come. And here in Ephesians, that is paralleled by of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Its name is derived from the Father. And the family being referred to here is not the whole of mankind, it's the household of God, the house for God's name that was promised all those years before to David. Now, bearing that in mind, come back to chapter 2, because the idea of the house is also here in some of Paul's words in that chapter. Towards the end of the chapter, we come in then at verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Of course, that figure of a house would have had an immediate significance to the brothers and sisters in Ephesus. Jewish converts had left their temple, and the Gentiles had abandoned the temple of Diana, all for a new way in Christ, and in so doing they had become part of God's house. You're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. In other words, the foundation which the apostles and prophets have laid. And remember, when it talks about prophets here in verse 20, it's not speaking about the Old Testament prophets, it's talking about New Testament prophets. The foundation which the apostles and New Testament prophets have laid. And if you want evidence for that, well, you've got them in chapter 3 and verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. So it's New Testament it's talking about here. Apostles and prophets. The foundation that they had then laid. And the foundation itself, of course, is Christ. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Or as Paul puts it here in Ephesians 2, verse 20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone of this building, mighty building that is being erected. Of course, the Old Testament had spoken about this. Think about the words of Isaiah 28. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. So there's the foundation stone of the building in Isaiah 28. And then we come to Psalm 118, where, which the Lord Jesus identified with himself in the New Testament, and there we read about the chief cornerstone, the headstone of the building. The stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvellous in our eyes. And both of those stones referred to are cornerstones, one at the foot, one at the head of the building. And both of these passages are brought together beautifully by the Apostle Peter. I think we may have to finish at this point. Let's come to 1 Peter and chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, where in just a few verses, Peter brings together these stone passages. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Writing to brothers and sisters, he says, and Christ is a subject here, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed, rejected indeed men, but chosen of God and precious. So the figure, of course, is based on the temple. Christ is called a living stone, rejected by men, but by contrast, chosen by God. He's really the chief cornerstone. And then in verse 6, 
Peter quotes those words from Isaiah 28 that I just referred to a moment or two ago. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And when you go back to Isaiah 28, it specifies it's the foundation stone. So yes, he's the chief cornerstone, it's the foundation stone of this building that is being erected. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. So those who are true disciples of the Lord Jesus are going to share the divine estimate of Christ. He is precious. Just in passing, some versions, the Revised Version, for example, gives an alternative translation in verse 7. And it reads like this. And to you therefore which believe is the preciousness. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. To you who believe is the preciousness. What preciousness? It's the preciousness that Peter has spoken about back in verse 18 of chapter 1. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Unto you who believe, says Peter, is the preciousness. In other words, it's the preciousness of redemption he's talking about here. It takes us back, doesn't it, to Ephesians 1 verse 7. The forgiveness of our sins, the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful privilege it is. But, as Peter says in verse 7, to those who are disobedient, the stone that the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. And there, of course, he's citing Psalm 118, verse 22. It's the headstone of the building. And finally, in verse 8, he says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. And that's Isaiah 8, verse 14. So he brings together all these stone passages, you know. He's the foundation stone, he's the headstone of this building, but he's also a stone of stumbling to those who refuse to believe in him. Just while we're here in 1 Peter 2, it's worth noticing that the elect are also described as living stones. Verse 5. Ye also, as lively or living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Living stones. We have to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to conform to the pattern of the chief cornerstone. In other words, we have to build into our lives those characteristics that were manifested in the Son of God. And so together we make up this spiritual house. And the process of building it is going on at the moment. It won't be completed until Christ's return. We have to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Our sacrifices are not the dead carcasses of animals or the blood of bulls and goats, but the sacrifice of our own self-indulgence, the giving up of our lives in dedication to God. And just finally, we come back to Ephesians chapter 2, because that is the thought to be found at the end of that chapter, is it not? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 21. In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. So the architect then, says Paul, is God, and this building is one that grows. You know, you can't stand still in the truth. You can't tread water. Either we're making spiritual growth in our lives, or we're actually slipping backwards. And this building itself is one that grows. Growth is expected of all in Christ. 
But of course, God himself is in no sense confined to a physical building. He is the master of the universe. So God willing, we're just going to finish off this thought when we come to our study tomorrow.